Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's, that's my son. Amen, Josiah. You know, in, in Jesus' name, you know, the, we, when, when, he was, when we were pregnant with him, when my wife was pregnant with him, uh, and I said some, some, to somebody one day that we were pregnant with our first son, and they said, you're not pregnant. Your wife was pregnant. <laughs> so I'm correcting myself. When, when, my wife, when my wife was pregnant, you know, I, I came with the name, amen, in Jesus' name, amen. And then she came with the name Josiah, so his name is Amen Josiah. So, you know, uh, so... You know, the word amen means let it be so, and Josiah means God heals. So let it be so, God heals. And that's his name, and, uh, and he's going he's gonna to sing for Jesus until Jesus comes back. And uh, we, we have two more girls, uh, Alithia and Alexandria, and that's my wife, Chelsea. And we're, we're, we're excited to be here with you tonight. And I, I'm really humbled for Pastor Troy and Pastor Becky for letting us come again. And we were here with my mom and dad in May uh, this year, so we're, we're delighted that we're back to Christ Tabernacle. And I had to share this story with you. Uh, we, my, my son was, I, I believe he was four years old, and uh, that was in 2014, I believe. And my wife, she was working at the time for a company, and she has to come to the Walmart in Princeton to store some stuff on the aisles. While she was doing that, my son and I, we actually parked in Christ Tabernacle parking lot. And we prayed here on the parking lot and we prayed for the church and for the pastor, even though I didn't meet him at the time. And this is what we prayed, my son and I. One day, the Lord Jesus will open a door and will come here and preach the gospel. <laughs> Amen. And so... Uh, I'm thankful to the Lord Jesus that he opened that door, so thank you. And uh, I, I have limited time, so let's go to, let's go to uh, Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, we'll start from there. Uh, I'm just going to quickly share a uh, little bit about us. Uh, we have an orphanage and a Christian school in, in South India from a state called Andhra Pradesh. That's where my parents take care of orphan children. And we have a Christian school at the orphanage where we teach uh, uh, Bible as one of the subjects in the classroom. And we also plant churches in unreached areas in South India. And this November, I'm going to India to train pastors and uh, work at the orphanage. And one of these days, your pastor will come. Uh, so I, I, we just talked to on the phone a uh, couple of weeks ago, and you know, he's going to come one of these days, so uh, just pray for him that the time is right and he can come there with me. Uh, but we're going back uh, to India in November, and I just shared with him uh, that we're doing a tent revival, an old-fashioned tent revival in Mayfield, Kentucky on September 11, 12, and 13, if you would keep us in prayer. And we're also going to tent revival in uh, Wingo, Kentucky in October. Uh, so keep that in prayer if you would. And the Lord opened a door, Pastor, to go to Campbellsville University uh, to speak to the student body. The first week in October, we will be in Campbellsville University. And the professors told me that most of the students, they don't believe the Bible is the word of God. And that's a good mission field to go back there. So, uh, so keep us in your prayer uh, for this upcoming opportunities coming up. Uh, but uh, just to give you a, a, an understanding where I come from, uh, I, uh, my ancestors were uh, Hindus. They worship idols. They believe in reincarnation. And uh, they, uh, they, they just live their lives just worshiping idols. And they're superstitious people. That that's was my background uh, from my ancestors. But there was a missionary came to... Uh, one of the places in India during British, when British was ruling India, he came there and he preached the gospel to my ancestors. And, uh, and my great-grandfather, he was a Hindu scholar. He was really radical about uh, Hinduism, and he was a, he was a rough guy. And uh, this missionary came up to him one day, and he was sharing the gospel with him. And you know what my great-grandfather said? 
I don't like you. And if you come back tomorrow, I'm going to kill you. So, uh, so the missionary stayed away from my great-grandfather, but he had a small group of people, and he was teaching under a tree, and these words echoed all the way from the Bible study one day to where my great-grandfather was working on his farm, and my great, uh, the, the missionary said from the tree to, uh, uh, to the group of people that if you believe in Jesus, you don't need to die. Jesus already died for you. And when he, when he said that, I believe the Holy Spirit, you know, carried those words all the way where my great grandpa was working on his farm. And he heard those words and those words fascinated him as a Hindu scholar that if I believe in Jesus, I don't need to die. And he wants to learn more about it. So after everybody left from the Bible study, he went to the missionary and said, listen, I'm not going to kill you, but tell me what it means that if I believe in Jesus, I don't need to die. And after three weeks of Bible study, the missionary explained that Jesus came to die and he's risen so that you can be forgiven, so that you can be healed from your bodily diseases and you can be redeemed from destruction, from anxiety, from depression, and you can also have life after death and you can have hope and love in this world. And after learning those things from the Bible, after three weeks, my great-grandfather knelt on his farm and gave his life to Jesus. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. But, but let, me, let me say this to you. Most of the people in Western culture, in the United States or in Europe, they don't understand what it means to be a Christian. What it means to believe in the Lord Jesus and carry your cross every day, no matter what you face. When he... Uh, trusted in the Lord Jesus, my great-grandfather, when he began to escort the missionary to go to other towns, persecution began to take place. People stopped doing business with my great-grandfather because he was a farmer by trade, and they were threatening him. And one day he took some of his water buffaloes to, to a pond for the buffaloes to drink water, and eight people came from behind. They dragged him all the way into the pond and they were kicking him and drowning him in the pond and said, if you don't stop escorting the missionary and if you, if you don't stop believing in that Jesus, we're going to kill you here. And he was losing his breath under the waters. And uh, he remembered that Jesus is in heaven and Jesus can answer your prayers when you call upon him. And he cried out loud and said, Jesus, if you're really there in heaven, help me. I need your help today. And as he prayed, the power of God moved in that situation. And he began to rise out of those waters. And he shook all those eight people who were kicking him and drowning him in the water. He got up out of those waters. And he walked out away from that pond. And he got his water buffaloes. And they were all watching him, all those eight people. And he said, don't mess with me. I have Jesus on my side. And he walked away from that place. Amen. Amen. And before he died, he, he gave some of his land to build a church in that area. And he helped 200 missionaries to be on the mission field. And, uh, and that's how Jesus came into my family. That's how Jesus came and, 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 and oh, we're serving the Lord Jesus today. And my son and my daughters, they will be fourth generational Christian before the Lord Jesus comes back. I just want to give a, a, you know, a story behind you know, where I come from, or what my family was before and what we are doing today. And uh, you know, God puts a dream in, in everybody's heart, right? Especially to the youth here tonight. I want, I want, I want, I want you to remember this. In, in Psalms 139, in Psalms 139, uh, David is saying, even before he was formed, God wrote a book about him. Amen? 
And I want to encourage you, youth here tonight, even everybody here tonight, God wrote a book about you. Our Lord Jesus wrote a book about you. And let's uh, uh, fulfill that book, what he has written. In, you know, Jesus is going to come back, but we have a job to do here. Amen? Yes. And, and, and God put a dream when I was 11 years old, living in India, that one day he will bring me to the United States. And he will take me to a Bible college and he will use me as a backyard missionary. Uh, that's what he told me. And, uh, and, uh, and that was an impossible dream for me because uh, we don't know anybody in the United States. And it's like uh, halfway around the world, you have to cross Indian Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, and you have to come here. Uh, uh, so it's impossible in the natural, but I kept the dream in me since I was 11 years old. And uh, uh, one day I saw an airplane flying by in the sky. And I prayed under my breath, Jesus, can you put me on one of those airplanes and bring me to the United States to go to college? And when I was 22, mom and dad, they gave me a Bible. They ha I had a big bag of clothes and $630 in my hand. That's all I had. And I landed in Chicago airport. $630 and a Bible and a bag of clothes and a broken English. <laughs> I didn't even know what, is a, what, what, what was a hot dog at that time. Because growing up in India, I never had hot dog. And in my Indian brain, when people were talking about hot dog, I was literally thinking, it's dog meat. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, hot dog. So that's what I was thinking. So my wife still helps me whenever I don't understand something. She, I'll ask her what, what was that and she explains to me. So, but the Lord Jesus has been faithful to me. Amen. You know, from, a, from an 11 year old boy till today, Jesus has been faithful to me. And he's faithful to you, especially to the youth. You know, when you go back to school, wherever you are working, remember that Jesus wrote a book about you and fulfill that book before he comes back. Amen? And with the time I have, let's go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a few scriptures here. Uh, Acts chapter 4, starting from, starting from verse 22. Acts chapter 4, starting from verse 22. The Bible says, For the man was more than 40 years of old, on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. When they had released, they went to their own companions and reported all the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And they said this, they, they, they heard this, and they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against his Christ. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, notice that verse 29, now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your born servants may speak your word with all confidence. While you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they prayed, when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. Amen. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Amen. Hallelujah. Father. 
In the name of the Lord Jesus with Holy Spirit help. I thank you for the next few minutes. May the help of the Holy Spirit give understanding and revelation to each one of us here tonight that we can grab hold of your promise and your revelation that we will walk how your apostles walked in those early days. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You know, if you notice here, Peter and John, uh, they, they were going to the hour of prayer in, in chapter 3, and there was a guy, he was begging at the temple gates, and Peter perceived him that day and said, in the name of the Lord Jesus, rise up and walk. This man was 40 years old, and he's been begging for a long time, but that day, this man was healed. Amen? Amen. And let me say this. Peter didn't say, you know, praise God, you know, God bless you. But Peter actually grabbed him and said, let's go into the house of God. And as he took them into the house of God, there were people, instead of being happy and rejoice, they were, they were actually being angry at Peter and John, and they took them to the high council and to the, to the, to the high priest, and they were threatening them and saying, you don't, you don't want to talk, you don't talk about the name of Jesus. Don't talk about Jesus. Don't preach this gospel about Jesus. They were threatening them. They were, they, they, they were intimidating them and put fear in them. And they told them, don't talk about Jesus anymore. And as we read, verse 22, all the way, notice, you know, what, what did the apostles do? What did Peter and John do? You know, the, the Bible says in, in verse 23, when they had released they went to their own companion and reported all the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Amen. You know, if I can say something, my friends, don't neglect your local church. Don't neglect your pastor. This is the place. This is the safe place. You can come. You can come to find peace, joy, strength. A restoration, and this is the place you need to come back. No matter what's going on at the workplace, what you hear outside the world, I encourage you, as, uh, as Peter and John came back to their own company, come back to church faithfully. Be under your pastor. Let the grace of God minister to you because, you know, there's a grace upon this man and upon his wife to pastor this church. Amen. And I'm teaching from the word of God. If Peter and John can go back to their own company, we should go back to our own churches. No matter what the enemy is doing, or, you know, if, if nobody shook your hand on Sunday, don't get offended. If people didn't talk to you or in a smile, don't get offended because we come here to worship Lord Jesus and we come here because of one agenda to grow and to... Uh, to get equipped and to grow in the Lord Jesus. And when we are together, I'm telling you, the enemy cannot touch us. Right, right. Amen. So I encourage you, be faithful to the local church. Be faithful to the house of God as Peter and John did. Because when you do that, you're going to gain strength. Because this is where you're going to find people who can pray with you. They know how to believe with you. They know how to encourage you and lift you up. And you need to put, you know, all the differences and work together as a family. Amen? Yes. Work together as a family. And, and notice what the Bible says. When they heard this, they all, uh, they all lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, Oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So one, number one thing, my friends, I want to encourage you, when you are intimidated by the world, when you are intimidated you know, at your workplace, at the school, wherever you are, don't just be calm. Don't be silent. Speak. Speak and talk to God about whatever your concern is. Whatever your intimidation is, whatever you're dealing with, your worry, your, your need, talk to the Lord Jesus in prayer. Amen? If you are intimidated about sharing the gospel, talk to him. If you are intimidated and afraid to pray with somebody else, 
talk to your pastor and his wife or to the co-leaders in the church and say, I, I, I'm struggling in this area. Can you pray with me? And pray to God in prayer. Amen? Amen. That's the number one key. I, I, I want to point at you from this passage in verse 24. Instead of being quiet, instead of being angry, instead of being intimidated by the high council that day, Peter and John went back to their own company and they began to pray together and express their needs and their, their, their worries to God in heaven. Amen? That's the number one thing I encourage you to do when you're sharing the gospel, when you're intimidated. And this can be applied in every area of life. You know, you can, you can be mad at your wife or your husband or fellow brother or sister in, in, in the Lord or you might be upset with your friend. Don't be calm. Don't be silent. Speak. Speak in the proper way and deal with that problem in prayer. Amen? And, 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 and number two, verse 25, notice what the Bible says. Who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our fathers, David your servant said, why did the Gentiles rage? You know, there's a lot of things going on in our nation right now, around the world. And you might wonder why all these things are happening. And the people's devise futile things. There are a lot of foolish people doing things right now. The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Verse 27, for truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. Notice this, this is what they're praying. This is what they're praying. And I encourage you to pray in this pattern regarding witnessing, regarding sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus, regarding whatever intimidation or worry or fear you have. Pray in this pattern as the, as, as the apostles did. You know, the Lord told me one day, Kamal, it's okay the way you pray, but he, the Lord told me I'm going to find more results and I'm going to get more answers if I learn how to pray according to the word of God. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You know, when you pray according to the word of God, there's no wrong doctrine. Right? right? Yeah. And there's no room for enemy to do anything to disturb your mind and, uh, and put any fear in you. So I encourage you to pray like this. In verse 27, notice what the Bible says. For truly in the city they are gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. You know, you can pray like this. Father, in Jesus' name, according to that divine hand, help me as I go to school today. Give me opportunities to share the gospel. May your hand or May your hand help me today. May your hand help me at workplace. May your hand help me at the restaurant, at the gas stations, that your hand will give me strength and confidence because when the hand of God is upon you, I'm telling you, no weapon, no fear, no intimidation which is formed or which is going to form shall not prosper. Amen? Amen. You know, in Psalms 145, the Bible says in verse 16, the hand, when you have the hand of God in your life, he's going to fulfill every desire you have. Amen? So I encourage you to pray like this, uh, what, 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 what we see here, that according to verse 28, pray that God's hand and his purpose will be done in that situation. Verse 29, notice how they're praying. Now, Lord, take note of their threats. Whatever your intimidation, my friend, to share the gospel, whatever fear or anxiety or worry or lack of confidence you have to pray with somebody when they're dealing with some kind of worry or sickness or trouble, pray like this. Father, take note of this. I'm giving this anxiety to you. I'm giving this fear and intimidation to you. I need your hand in my life. 
And I'm giving these fears to you and you're going to help me. And Father, the enemy is bombarding me with thoughts of defeat and discouragement. And I want you to know this at the throne of grace. And pray. Pray according to the scripture. Because that's how Peter and John prayed with their own companion that day. And notice what it says in verse 29. Grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence. What did they say? Not only they presented their fear, their worry, their concern, their need to the Lord in prayer. But they also prayed in verse 29, grant confidence to your servant. What, what, what is your name? The curly hair? Miguel. You know, I'm going to use Miguel because the word of God applies to everybody. These are the love letters to you, Miguel, from the Lord Jesus. And in verse 29, the way they're praying, you can pray like that. You can say, Father, in Jesus' name, you know, I feel anxiety. I feel, I feel lack of confidence sometimes. I feel worry, our, our, our loneliness. But in spite of all these things, I thank you, Holy Father. You're granting me confidence and boldness. To speak and to talk and to pray. Amen? Amen? When you pray like that consistently, I'm telling you, Miguel, you're going to fulfill the book Jesus has written about you. Amen? Amen? So I encourage you, I, I encourage you to pray like this, that God, not, not only you're putting your concerns in front of him, but you're praying according to the word of God, grant me, Father, Today, opportunities at the restaurant. Grant me, Father, today, your boldness at the workplace. Grant me, Father, today, your confidence to share Jesus, what my pastor is teaching on Sunday this week, on Wednesday night, that you're going to help me to have that opportunities and that boldness and confidence in Jesus. Amen? Amen. I encourage you to pray like this every day. Right? And uh, my time, well, it's 7.20, so I had to go. Uh, <laughs> verse 30, the Bible says, and notice how they're praying again. While you extend your hand to heal. So the way Miguel can pray, the way Christ tabernacle can pray, while you extend your hand to heal, signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Yes, amen. amen? So you can pray like this, Miguel. Father, not only I'm asking you for confidence and boldness today, but by, by extending your hand, you're going to grant me signs and wonders when I pray with people, when I share the gospel, that I'm going to see signs and wonders in my life. Yes, Amen? And this world needs to see signs and wonders. Yes. You know, the, the, the guys... The agnostics who don't believe, you know, the, the, the agnostics, you know, they, they think they believe in some kind of higher power, but they don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord. They need to see this sign and wonder. Yeah. The atheist who, don't, who believes there is no existence of God, they need to see this sign and wonder that Jesus can heal people. Jesus can, you know, heal tuberculosis. Jesus can raise the cripple uh, uh, to walk. And when they see this sign and wonder, you know, they're going to be open. They're going to be open to come into your church. They're going to be open to read their Bibles. And they're going to be open to learn more about Jesus. Amen? Amen. So I encourage you to pray like this. Uh, I encourage you to pray like this. Uh, and, and notice in verse 31, when they had prayed, notice what happened. The place where they gathered together was shaken. Was shaken. They didn't just pray, God bless me and my family and the meal I'm eating. Amen. Right? We, we don't need those kind of prayers to change our nation. Those kind of prayers won't affect our nation and your, your Princeton, Kentucky in this area. But we need prayers of passion and power with the help of the Holy Spirit. And when you say in Jesus' name, amen, that place needs to change. Yes, yes. Amen? amen? 
That place needs to change. And if God can do that for those people that day, he can do that at Christ's tabernacle today. Amen. He can do that in Miguel's life. He can do that in this youth today. Whatever you're dealing with, we serve a God who is not a respecter of person. If he can do it 2,000 years ago, he can do it again today. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And, 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 and I, I'm in a different generation, but some of you, uh, my brothers, my, my, you know, you're, you're all, some of you like, you know, who are at the age of 60 and 70, you know some of your grandparents who went to the house of God before the, uh, before the service started. They were at the altars. They're praying. They're, they, they, they're interceding. They're supplicating for the service, for the city. And when people walked into those services, the power of God was tangible so much that you know, the, 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 the people were convicted of their sin. And people were healed. People were set free. Those kind of prayers will bring the revival. Those kind of prayers will bring a change and the places will shake, right? I have six minutes. So let me, let, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me say this. The, uh, most, some of you probably know this. Uh, after World War II, most of the Eastern Europe has been controlled by a communist. Most of the Eastern Europe was communist. And uh, there was no freedom for the gospel to go to the Eastern Europe at the time. And there was an iron wall, which people call at the time. And there was suppression. There was depression in that area, darkness. But there is one church, my friends. It's called St. Nicholas Church in Eastern Europe. They started a prayer group with, with 50 people every week, praying for their nation, praying for their continent, that this iron wall will come down, this oppression and darkness will come down in Jesus' name, that there will be a revival. The gospel will have freedom to go into those nations. You know what happened? The 50 group of people continued to pray every week, and the, 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 the prayer meeting began to grow every week. And one day, one day, there were like 10,000 people and the, the, the church didn't have place for everybody. And people have to stand outside the church, around the church in lines. They're praying, they're interceding, they're supplicating for their nations, for their continent, for revival, for the iron wall to come down. And the communist party took note of that. They blocked the roads for not, people not to come to the prayer meetings. They threatened people not to attend the prayer meetings. But in spite of all of that, my friends, the prayer meeting began to grow. And they began to intercede. See, you need to pay a price. It's not simple for things to happen. You need to overcome pressure. You need to overcome fear and opposition from the enemy, from the governments, from whatever the, uh, the point of view at the, uh, going on. We need to be bold and be confident like Peter and John, like those apostles. You know what happened? God used Ronald Reagan in the political arena. But let me tell you, God used the church more than all to bring that iron wall down. Amen? In the fall of that year, the iron wall came down. Because there is one church began to pray. And they know their authority in the Lord Jesus. They know how to intercede and supplicate in the Holy Spirit. And those, that iron wall came down. Amen? You know, last week, uh, I, I, got, I, I got a phone call. Uh, I got a phone call from a lady. She said, Brother Kamal, do you have time? I said, yes, I have time. And she said, uh, uh, she said uh, uh, my, my daughter and my, my, my grandkids, they, they were threatened by their, by, by their father that he's not letting them go out of the house. And he cut the tires of my, my daughter's car that she cannot go anywhere. And, and, and they, were, they were in fear. They were bombarded by this, uh, uh, by, by this situation in the house. And she was crying on the phone. And, and, and I said, let, let, let's pray. Let's pray. 
and I began to, I, I began to pray like, you know, I, I began to pray w- with the authority the Lord gives you. And I began to say, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus with Holy Spirit help, I thank you that I take authority over this stronghold and this, uh, this fear, this, this depression and this uh, chaos to stop in the name of the Lord Jesus and be bow at the feet of the Lord Jesus from this house and from this family. That this man will not hurt anybody in the family. Amen? Amen. And we began to pray in the Holy Spirit. When we began to pray in the Holy Spirit, I said, let's worship Jesus now. And we began to worship Jesus. And, uh, and she texted me later on and said... Nobody was hurt in the house. And he just simply walked out of the house and said, I will be back. And he just walked away. And God kept them safe. Amen. And we have a small building in Paducah, Kentucky. That's where we do our outreaches. And we have Bible studies there. And this one guy, uh, uh, his wife told me that he, he, he's being depressed and he's been... Uh, He's, been, uh, he's not in his right mind. And I told him if he can come to our ministry building so I can pray for him last week. And he came to the building. And as soon as he walked into the building, he was not even interested in talking to me. And I said, can you sit down? And he said, because I asked him to sit, he, he was not really willing. Then I said, what's going on? He said, I'm offended by my church. And I'm drinking. And I am depressed, and I'm backsliding. And what do you do in that situation? And I began to read the word of God for him. And I said in Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Spirit and power, and how Jesus went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed of the devil, enemy, Satan. And I said, your oppression can be free by the blood of Jesus if you let Jesus do it. But he was not willing at that moment. And I began to talk to him that you, you can be free if you let Jesus, you know, let, let him free. And I even told him, most of the Christians, they know the Bible. But the only problem is they don't follow it. So I told him, because he was saying, I know that scripture. I know this scripture. Then I said, the problem is you don't follow it. That's why you don't have freedom. And I laid hands on him. And I, I, I took authority over that familiar spirit of drinking. And that, that depression. Uh, and that stronghold to leave him by the blood of Jesus Christ with Holy Spirit help. And I began to pray in the Holy Spirit. And you know what, what this man did? He's in his 60s. He began to say, Jesus, help me. I need help. Help me to stop drinking. Help me to come back to you. And he began to pray. Amen? Amen. And I texted him next day and his wife. And his wife said, my husband is reading Bible today. Amen? I texted again yesterday. And she said, he's reading Bible today. Amen? Amen. Who does this kind of things? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus. But we need to do our job. Amen? Amen. 731. I'm going to stop here. And we're going to pray. Amen? You know, I don't know if there's a... You have a protocol how to pray? Okay. Uh, You know, I, I, I... I don't know about you. You might get upset. You might not let me come back again. Uh, but, uh, but I love America. And I don't like when people talk bad about America. You know, it, it, you know, people are the ones who mess this country. America was fine. It's fine. But it's people and their agendas and their values messed up this nation. But I really, I really believe there's going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit revival. You know, United States of America again. Before Jesus comes back. Amen. And one of the way it's going to happen. When the church. When Christ's tabernacle take its place. Yes. And intercede for our nation. Intercede for Princeton, Kentucky. 
and supplicate for the lost, for the prodigals, for the sick to come and be healed and be saved. Amen. For next few minutes, can we pray together for our nation, for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit revival, for our city, and for Christ's tabernacle, that what is your part in this city? Amen. If God can use one church, St. Nicholas Church in Eastern Europe, and when that prayer meeting grow and grow and became big and pull those strongholds down, God can use Christ's tabernacle to do the same thing if you do your job. Amen? Amen. And I want, you to, I want you to come forward. Anybody who is comfortable, just come forward to the altar. And, and, and let's, let, I'm going to lead in prayer. And then, uh, then, then we're going to continue to pray for our nation. But I encourage you to come. I encourage you to come and lay everything at the altar. Lay everything at the altar. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus with Holy Spirit help, I thank you. I praise you for, for, for the freedom we have in this nation. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, my Savior, I come before you right now. I come before you, Holy Father in heaven. Holy Father, you are holy and holy and holy. Let thy glory fill me, God. Let thy glory fill Christ's tabernacle. Let thy glory fill Princeton, Kentucky. Let thy glory fill United States of America right now. In Jesus' mighty name. And Father God, I thank you for the blood of Jesus. The help of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In, in United States of America. And I, I, I proclaim that America shall be saved. Princeton, Kentucky shall be saved. And Christ's tabernacle has a part in this last day revival. And I thank you, Father, as we pray right now. You're hearing our prayers for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit revival in America. In every church in the United States of America. And we repent where we have missed you, Lord of hosts. Have mercy upon us. And we also lift up the prodigals in this nation. We lift up the sick in this nation. That you're healing them. That the church of the Lord Jesus will come together in unity in this nation. The churches in Princeton, Kentucky will come together in unity to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And I thank you, Father, your favor, your anointing upon Pastor Troy and Pastor Becky that they have a part in this, in this area to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And I thank you for using this congregation as the church in Eastern Europe. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.